And so I wanted to also share our upcoming seminar series that we have. Um, we have one coming up in, um, in June on NIH funding um, and also finding NIH funding with Dr. Rick McGee at Northwestern and also in July, we'll also have a NIH uh, proposal writing webinar as well. Um, like I mentioned that we'll be, this is recorded and um, we also have uh, questions will be answered at the end. If you have current questions as burning questions as we go along, please feel free to enter them in the chat box. There's also a Q&A session. And at the end, 15 minutes before the hour, uh, we will uh, respond to these questions. And so I would like to introduce um, Dr. Marion Fitzgibbons, who is a professor in pediatrics and also at the health, uh, health policy and administration at the School of Public Health to, and she is also a multi-site PI for Chicago Check at UIC. My name is Beverly Chukudozi. I'm also um, pro program director at, of Chicago Check at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, Marion will then introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Karen Peterson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Beverly. And I have to say, I love your background behind your picture. It's great. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you very much and uh, really welcome to the Chicago Czech webinar. There's, there's, we're having a series of these. This is uh, one in several that we're going to be producing, but it's, we're really, it's a pleasure today to introduce Dr. Karen Peterson. I've known Karen for maybe about 10 years or so. She's an incredible colleague and she's also an expert on biosketches. And more and more, the biosketch has become a really central part of applications to NIH and to other agencies too, federal and non-federal. And so it'll be important today to listen and figure out when you're putting in applications, what is your central role in the application? Who are you collaborating with? What strengths do you bring to the application? Because this is a snapshot that reviewers years ago didn't really spend much time on, and now they do, mostly because of space limitations. So just briefly, Dr. Karen Peterson is a research assistant professor in epidemiology in the School of Public Health. She also has a degree here from, um, degree here from there. And she is a co-director on the T32, which is NCI funded cancer education and career development program. So we look forward to hearing her talk about the importance of biosketches and how to put them together, and then there will be a Q&A. So thank you very much for coming to this webinar. Karen? Great. Thank you so much, Mary, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, let me just share my screen. And I'm going to hide all these views. Okay, so um, crafting your biosketch. Um, this is really what I want to cover today. I'm going to talk with you about what it is and what it isn't. We'll talk about the major, the four major sections and unpack them. And then importantly, talk about how you get started. Um, Beverly shared some um, stats about the audience. And I know that while many of you have biosketches, many of you haven't started your bio sketches. So um, one of the things that I think is helpful is just kind of some approaches to getting started. And throughout, I'm gonna share some examples of some of the more challenging sections, namely the personal statement and the contributions to science section and share some resources. And then as um, Marion and Beverly uh, pointed out, open it up to Q and A. So the biosketch, as Marion pointed out, is required for all grant applications, as well as any NIH grant progress reports. And importantly, the easiest way to think about the biosketch is that it allows reviewers to evaluate your expertise, your experience, and really your qualifications relative to the work that's proposed within the grant. So it's always, you're linking all of these different sections to the grant itself. Um, it describes your training, your education, your expertise, as well as the research that you've done, your productivity and your collaborations, and in also your track record of funding and publications. The other purpose is to highlight 
Um, if you're the PI, it highlights your role as PI, co-PI, uh, co-I, and collaborator qualifications for whatever the specific roles are in the proposed project. So um, always think about it as being linked to whatever the proposed project is. Um, it, uh, both the CV, the curriculum vitae, and the biosketch describe you as a researcher and the accomplishments, but think of the CV as this professional biography that can be quite lengthy, whereas the biosketch is an abbreviated record of your accomplishments, and moreover, it's very grant specific. So who needs to complete a biosketch? Anyone who's a senior or key research personnel and any other significant contributor. So if you have a contributor that is listed as needed or with 0% effort, but is contributing something significant to the proposal, to the grant project, they need to complete a biosketch. So here are the four sections of the current um, biosketch. There's the personal statement, positions and honors, contributions to science, and the research support section. So the personal statement and the contribution to science sections are by far the more, most challenging, particularly for early stage investigators. Positions and honors are really just lifted from your CV. If you have a resume, um, if you're a you know, brand new investigator, it's lifted from there. And research support's pretty simple to complete. So let me just unpack this a little bit. So the personal statement describes your experience and then importantly, and I can't emphasize this enough, connects um, your experience, your past experience, your current experience to the grant proposal, to your role on the grant proposal. It identifies your experience, it could identify a particular expertise, as well as highlighting publications that reflect your research relative to the grant proposal. And this is focus, the focus of the personal statement is about you as a researcher, as an academic researcher. It includes an opportunity to show some publications that link your work to the proposed project. Positions and honors, pretty straightforward. You list your employment, any professional memberships. Um, so if you're a member of a professional society, this would go here. If you have had leadership roles on a special interest group, for example, um, that would go here. And then any awards, any academic awards you received. If you're fairly new in your career, if you had any received any awards uh, in graduate school, they could go here. Um, but obviously any awards that you've received if you're a more senior researcher would go in this section. And then there's the contributions to science section. This is your research story. This is the focus about what you have done. So if the personal statement is about you, as an academic researcher, the contributions to science section is really a focus about what you have accomplished. Um, and then we'll talk in detail about this. And then there's the research support section, which is where you list your ongoing research support as well as um, more recent completed research support. Okay, so let's go into much more detail around each one of these sections. So section A, this personal statement, this is um, very prescribed. You're gonna start by describing the problem that you hope to address with your proposed research. You're gonna convey how your training and your past work or current work positions you to conduct the proposed research. And in this section, you're gonna identify relevant strengths that might not be described in your positions section, that's section B, or your contribution section. So this is, um, uh, especially if you're an early stage investigator, this is kind of the, the section that will really talk about you outside of the contribution section, outside of any grant support that you've received. Importantly, although we, we oftentimes discourage first person voice, it's really important to use the first person voice here. And this section is typically about a half a page. In this, you're going to emphasize your role in the research. You're gonna kind of wrap it up by talking about your role in the proposed research. If it's a PI, you're gonna talk about your leadership. Um, if you're a co-I or a collaborator, you'll talk about your complementary experience that is complementary to the research team. 
So in the personal statement, you can you have the opportunity to include up to four um, publications. And these would be publications that might not appear in the contributions to science section. Importantly, if, if at all possible, you want these to link to your grant proposal. Um, you're going to talk again about the relevant experiences of your past work or your training. It may be your technical expertise. It may be work that you've done in the past that links to this grant that really speaks to your qualifications to undergo the work that you propose to do in this grant in whatever role that may be as a co-I or PI or key research personnel. Notably, in this section, you have the opportunity to address any kind of impediments to your research. So if you've had issues of productivity, so if you have a gap in your um, timeline, that's really important to address. So if you have, let's say you graduated from um, college in 2010 and you went to graduate school in 2014 and you started your academic research career in 2019. You have a bit of a gap between college and graduate school. You want to explain that. Um, maybe that's a career. Maybe you were in an industry for a period of time. Um, on the other hand, you may have a situation in your academic career where because of illness, family obligations, something, you have a gap. So you were um, hired on as faculty and you had a one or two year gap. You don't need to go into great detail here, but it's really critical. If your, C, uh, if your bio sketch shows this absence of publications, so you have this gap in publications or a gap in funding, this is your opportunity in a sentence or two to describe this. So I've listed two um, examples. So the first example relates to something personal. Now you are absolutely not required to put anything detailed, uh, anything more detailed than what's listed here. In 2014, my career was disrupted due to family obligations. However, upon returning to the field, I immediately resumed my research project and, and then you jump into what you've done. Um, so this is an example where you're talking about a potential impediment with respect to your research, family obligations. Again, no details necessary. In the second example, this is where you might want to leverage some experience, some industry. So in this example, um, prior to pursuing my PhD in whatever field, I spent X number of years working in, and you might describe your industry. And then you would say, where I acquired skills that inform the conduct of my research, including so the second example is where what you're doing is you're maybe explaining a gap between um, undergrad and grad school that's significant, but you want to leverage that. You want to talk about how work in industry perhaps um, gave you some skills, whether it's leadership skills, um, multidisciplinary team work skills, whatever, things that might actually make you a better researcher and um, kind of tee you up for leading a grant if you're a PI. So um, this is where you would put this within the personal statement. Okay, so structure of the personal statement. Um, first and foremost, you start off with a goal of the proposed research with a simple sentence. The primary goal of the proposed research is. Now, you know, obviously in the grant, in the, um, research plan, you go on in great detail about this. But it, within your personal statement, because this biosketch is linked to a grant, you want to give a sentence about what this is all about. The second thing you would start out with, you would uh, include would be a summary of your past research. So a sentence like that begins with, my work has focused on. And again, what you're pulling out is work that would link to the goal, to the grant itself. Next, you talk about a summarizing your current research. I'm currently conducting research in, again, you want to highlight something that links to this project. And then connect, find a way of connecting past and current work with the proposed research. For this proposal, I will. This gets at both um, your role in the project and also making this connection between what you've done and what you will be doing. 
So this is sort of the, the narrative flow of this personal statement. Importantly, leverage your research statement. So we've all written research statements for a job, um, maybe for you're going up for um, promotion. You know, we have these lengthy research statements. Leverage that. That's where you can kind of mine that for material because um, that will kind of go um, list all the work that you've done in the past. And what you can do is pull from there um, to summarize things that are relevant to the particular uh, project. Importantly, tell a story. Really um, make the reader, reviewer understand who you are as an academic researcher. I can't emphasize this, this little bullet point enough. Use specific examples. What do I mean by that? Don't say something like, um, I am uniquely qualified to carry out this work. That's a very generic statement that could apply to dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of academic researchers. You might use that as an introductory phrase, but then you have to talk about exactly why you are uniquely qualified to carry out this work. So you have to use concrete examples. Um, and so the other piece of this is that you have the opportunity to list relevant publications that might not fit under your contribution section, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but would reveal something about you as a researcher or might highlight qualifications that you have for the proposed project. So when we talk about gathering publications for the contribution section, each of those sections we want to kind of have a theme. Within the personal statement, you can have sort of disparate um, publications. They don't necessarily have to all, especially for early stage investigators, they don't necessarily all have to harmonize and work towards this particular, um, towards the grant itself. Um, and I can't emphasize this enough, those of you who don't actually have a biosketch yet, draft your personal statement. It takes a long time to do a really good one and sooner and later you're going to need it. I do want to highlight um, a couple of things as for those of you who are PIs, you will have to draft personal statements for others on your um, grant, unfortunately. Um, and so one of the strategies is um, to um, use what you've written for the bios, uh, for the budget justification and utilize that to tailor the individual's personal statement. So what I typically do is I ask them to send me their bio sketch, and then I, I have written their um, budget justification paragraph, and then I tailor it and then send it back, obviously, to get permission to do that. So it's just a little hint of, of how you might um, approach the drafting of a personal statement for someone on your grant. Okay, so I want to just take a minute and talk about an example. This is available on the grants NIH.gov site. So this is a, an actual personal statement that they show and periodically they'll swap these out so you get to see different disciplines. And forgive the color coding, I know it looks a little patchworky, but I just want to highlight a few things here. So um, although this personal statement doesn't necessarily describe the project itself, it does open up by talking about the, the, the individual's role on the project. So I have the expertise, leadership training. Um, interestingly, expertise is repeated and motivation necessary to successfully carry out the proposed research project. I highlight this because make sure that you double check, triple check, so you don't have any of these sort of typos. So um, at the face, if this is all we saw, I would say that's not providing a concrete example. But this goes on to provide a lot of detail that supports that first statement. Um, broad background in psychology and then specific training and expertise. Um, and then further on with this underlined section, it gets more specific. My research includes neuropsychological changes associated with addiction. So this is part of what this grant is proposing to do. And so right away, we're recognizing that this individual has actually done work linked to this proposal. And then we're learning that this, this individual was a PI or a co-investigator 
on um, both university and NIH funded grants, which again, highlights qualifications. And then in the green, we see the work that this individual has done, which links to this later green section that talks about the current application building upon prior work. So in the green up here, we see the description of the prior work and then the statement that the proposal itself builds upon it. Um, again, this is a PI and so uh, the listing that's coming after this yellow is describing how this person has actually conducted research in the past that's, that makes them suitable to serve as PI. And then importantly, here's a statement during two th uh, that, that talks about a break. During 2005 and six, my career was disrupted due to family obligations. However, upon returning, blah, blah, blah. So my point here is that if you were to look at all of this individual's publications, you'd probably see a bit of a break here. And this, these two sentences very simply just explain that. And the other piece that I wanna point out here is that these publications are not necessarily all first author, but they all seem to highlight elements that feed into this particular grant uh, within the publications. Okay, the second, probably the easiest section to complete is the positions and honors section. Um, positions and employment, obviously listing your oldest first, any other relevant experience and professional memberships, as well as honors that you've uh, acquired. So here's a nice example, just positions and employment. This is not just um, academic positions, but um, postdocs, interim positions, and any kind of industry positions. And um, over here, what we have is not just membership, but leadership positions. So that's really important to highlight. And then any sort of honors. Okay, contributions to science, the second hardest section I think to write. So let, let me just first tell you what it is and then talk about how, um, some approaches to completing this. So the contributions to science section uh, describes up to five of your most significant contributions to science. Um, and if you're a fairly senior um, researcher, five is challenging to do because you probably have way more than that. So what you wanna do is winnow it down to the five that are most relevant to the grant itself. For each of those contribution sections, you're going to provide a brief background that frames the problem. You're gonna describe the Bain findings and convey the impact of the work on the field, uh, even if it's very incremental, and talk about your role. Each of these sections should be at most one half page because remember, the biosketch is strictly limited to five pages. So ideally, your contributions um, co and corresponding publications within each section will support your role on the project. So here's an example. If we are uh, developing a grant proposal for an intervention to reduce racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in hepatitis B vaccination rates, we might have three contributions to science sections. The first one might be all the interventions that the PI has developed, not necessarily interventions related to vaccination. The second, uh, and then all of the publications that are listed under there, up to four, would relate to interventions that the PI has developed. The second contribution would be research on racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities. And again, this could be in a variety of health outcomes, um, but it supports this overarching proposal. And then the third contribution related to this grant could be research on vaccination, and specifically hepatitis B vaccination. Um, it is here that you have the opportunity to link to all of your published work with the My Bibliography link, and I'll talk about that towards the end. So ultimately, you know, if you have five sections where you have four, you can have up to four publications, that's 20 publications. And then in your personal statement, you have an additional four. So the maximum number of publications you can note, assuming they're all different, would be 24. 
many people, especially more senior people, have many more than that. This um, link at the, that comes at the end of the contribution section allows reviewers to click on to your bibliography. Okay, so let, let me just um, go over a minute of uh, this particular example, again, from the grants.nih.gov site. So this would be one of the topic areas. Um, I personally like to bold the, um, the topic area itself. So maybe the, oh gosh, my internet unstable. Um, hopefully you all can still hear me. Um, I like to bold what, um, what's useful. Um, in this case, this might be a substance abuse would be the contributions to science section um, or maybe even title it. So this um, individual is talking about the publications that um, address substance abuse. Um, major findings, these publications found that older adults appear in a variety of primary care settings uh, or seek mental health providers to deal with emerging addiction problems. Um, talking again about that they do document emerging problem and guide primary care providers and geriatric mental health providers to recognize symptoms. So again, we're seeing the um, major findings of these four publications. And, um, and then this last sentence, or the second to last sentence, is talking about its contribution to, to the scientific literature. And then noting in this last highlighted portion, um, the role that this individual played. And again, like the uh, publications within the personal statement, um, these publications relate to the contributions to science section. So you also um, ideally should develop or, or modify the contributions to science section for others on your grant, or at least your co-eyes. And it's much more challenging. Um, it requires some degree of revision depending upon their role. So co-investigators are much more important that, that each of the contributions to science section um, fits in with the, and supports the grant proposal, that's more important than say contributors versus key personnel. So there's sort of this um, hierarchy, hierarchy here. Um, and the contribution topics and publications ideally should support the individual's role. I will say this is particularly important with biostatisticians. Um, you know, we have biostatisticians doing a whole lot of very esoteric work uh, but if what they're doing is supporting longitudinal analysis, then we don't need to know about some of the much more challenging work that they're doing. Um, at, certainly not in the personal statement, um, but we certain and, and it's okay to put that more esoteric work in there, but for sure we would want to know about their work in longitudinal analyses. Okay, and the last section is research support. Um, this is where you list both your ongoing and your completed research project for the past three years. These would be uh, your not, uh, NIH and non-NIH. So, you know, for example, Na ACS National American Cancer Society National Funding. It's important to separate these two sections, the current research from the ongoing, um, the, sorry, the current and ongoing research from the completed research. So you'll have these two headings. Um, if you are a researcher that's well-funded, then you want to really think about the projects that are most relevant to the research proposed in the application. Um, and then, uh, importantly, there's some things that you, you need to include and things you don't need to include. So you want to create a little paragraph that indicates the overall goals of the project and the responsibilities that you had but you don't include things like person months or direct costs. Um, you don't include any pending proposals, nor do you include other support. And here's how um, NIH describes other support. And ideally, if you're lucky, like we are at the School of Public Health, you have an Office of Research Services that can pull all this together for you. Um, if you um, have had grant funded fellowships, they belong in this section. So here's what it looks like. Um, you have your heading of 
ongoing research support and completed research support where oops, you're noting the grant number, the PI, the time frame, a very brief um, purpose, and your particular role. And that's all you need to put in there. So how do you get started? Um, so just a little tips and um, some resources for you. So I would encourage you to start with your personal statement um, and create this, what I call raw material for your grant. So start out by obviously stating the project goal in very concrete terms. Um, list your duties on the project and then catalog your current and past work. Just, you know, bullet point your research, your academic, your training, anything. And then you go back and align all of that with your particular role on the project. And that's what I call your raw material. And once you have that, then you can create the narrative in the way that I had described in the first person voice. In terms of your approach to creating that contribution section, I would suggest if you haven't done this, utilize that publication section of your CV. So in that you have, you know, presumably all of your publications listed. And what you would do is sort of um, group those publications. If you're really at a loss, and this was, this is really directed to early stage investigators or brand new researchers. If you're really at a loss to think about what your contributions of science to science are, think about grouping your publications to form these topic areas. You can have as few as two publications um, and as many as four. And then what you'll do is you review the abstracts in your publications for the key findings. And again, sort of maybe do this in bullet point form. And then what you do is you develop your narrative. Um, you summarize the findings in a very um, succinct way. It is important to note that you can, you don't have to include, you know, just first author publications or senior author publications. And then my other advice is to leverage what you have um, and to create generic biosketches and CVs. And by all means, keep them current. Um, you know, at least every four or five months, go back, make sure all of your publications are noted um, in your CV, in your My Bibliography, make sure you're bringing everything in there, um, any kind of positions and honors, any kind of funding, just make keep things current because invariably you'll be asked to produce a biosketch and it's sort of the last thing that you're thinking about. But if you have to, you know, run around and update everything, it takes away from the time you need to craft a really good personal statement. Um, make sure you create a research statement because that's a nice source material for your personal statement. And then um, utilize the existing resources. So let me just tell you about these. Um, so there's this link uh, called Science CV. So if you go to the grants.nihi.gov site, you'll see this icon over here. If you click on the icon, it brings you to um, an app that actually allows you to create a biosketch. What's nice about this is that that form forms um, formats all of your publications, which is great. Um, you do then want to save it in a Word document so that you can tweak it a little bit. Um, there's some funny things like I don't personally like the way the funding looks, um, and so I always modify it a little bit. So I would su suggest that once you've got this, you save it in a Word document and then just modify it a little bit. Um, importantly, you do need to have things like your personal statement written because you paste it into this template. Uh, but it's a, it's a huge time saver, frankly. And um, importantly, you have to make sure that you have your, the current template. And so this makes certain that you do have the current template. Make sure that you have gone in uh, to have your bi bibliography um, through NCBI. Um, that allows you to create this link, um, which goes at the end of your contributions to science section, this uh, complete list of published works. It's a live link, so the reviewer can literally click on to it and see the, all of your other publications. Um, some other comments, just some things to note. 
Um, it's a five page limit, a strict five page limit. Figures, tables, and graphics are absolutely not allowed. Um, they're a little finicky with respect to references. So while you don't need the digital object identifier or the PubMed reference number, you do have to have um, the manuscript ID, the PMC ID. And that's what's nice about um, creating the, the biosketch in um, the NIH site is because you'll get that PMC ID. And then importantly, use NCBI to create your bibliography and so that you can bring that live link into the contribution section. Um, citations can be repeated, especially for early stage investigators who might not have um, uh, numerous publications. You certainly can repeat them in the various sections. Um, importantly, manuscripts that haven't been accepted for publications may be included as part of your contribution section, but in the narrative portion. So in that uh, you could say something like, you know, I and my, co my, co my collaborators and I have recently completed uh, a meta-analysis on blah, 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 um, and, uh, you know, under, currently under review. But what you can't do is list it in one of those four publications um, unless it's actually been published. Um, additional research products can be included in your narrative. And here's a list of those um, research project products. And then lastly, the template, it has to be current. Um, and so you'll see at the top of every biosketch, there's this um, Office of Management and Budget number and then approved through. What again is nice about using that template uh, through the, the um, that icon is that you'll automatically have the current template. And I have no idea why they change these and when they change them, but um, all of a sudden you'll realize that, oh gosh, I thought I was using the right one and suddenly I have a new one. Um, and just here's some links to resources and just some acknowledgements. And now I wanna open up to questions. Thank you very much. Um, I will be allowing people to shortly um, to be able to participate and unmute themselves. But I will start with one of the questions that we have. Um, the first one is asked, is it okay to include citations both in personal statement and contribution to science? You mean the same citation? Absolutely, yep, you can repeat citations, yep. So to include them in your personal statement, do you cite, do you include citations in your personal statement and contribution to science? Um, oh, I see what you're saying. So do you, yes. Yeah, so do you, as you would in a manuscript, um, if you cite, you know, you're citing the results of the contribution and you would cite it. Yes. Yeah, so, so what you want to do is you have an opportunity to have four publications under each of those, right? And so what you would do is you, you would do a site format, absolutely. And I think, um, I think that um, our example shows that where you might note the results and then you'd put a number and then it would link to the publication beneath. So yeah, I think that's the question, right, Beverly? Yes, that was the yep. question. Yeah. Yep. And then the next question is, can you include bio archived, not yet um, peer reviewed publications? So you can, use, you can describe those, but they have to be within the narrative. They can't, you know how there, I showed you that, that there's the four, maximum of four publications. You can't put them down there, um, but you would describe them in your narrative. So you might say, um, you know, our team recently completed um, the following with this result and is uh, under review or, uh, you know, with planning to submit or something along those lines or, or unpublished or something like that. So you can refer to that for sure. It just has to be in the narrative section, not in the publication section. 
And then I will have one more question um, before others can join in and ask their question. Uh, should you include funding where you acted as a, a postdoc? Yeah, so that would be your if you have an NIH funded postdoc. So um, as Dr. Fitzgibbon shared, I am a co-director of the T32, which is an NCI funded and uh, training program, and we have pre and postdocs. And so they absolutely list their funding because it's an NIH related funding under current support. Mm -hmm. Um, so our attendees can unmute themselves and ask questions. Feel free to ask questions now. Thank you very much for all the information. Um, I have a follow-up question to the, um, whether you can uh, mention articles that have been published or not. So what if it's accepted? when it's accepted but not published yet, does that, can you list it then or you still shouldn't? Um, there is a, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember what this is called. There's the, um, there's the preprint stage where, um, and I wish I could remember what it's called, um, where it may be appearing in the electronic version. Is that what you mean? the electronic mm. version of the publication, or it, is even, it isn't even there yet? Not yet, yeah. Some of the journals they, in my field, they have, they have such long waiting times, like almost ah. a year until they actually publish oh. it, but they accept it really early. Like, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then what you would do is you would note that within your narrative. Unfortunately, okay. yeah, because it's very, it's very fussy in terms of requiring that PMC ID number that is the manuscript identifier. Um, that has to be included in those four publications under contributions or the personal statement. And so it has to be something that's, you know, gone through that cycle. But what you could do is um, just simply note the, you know, uh, in our recent um, manuscript, and you could talk about the title, and the major, we found that blah, 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 or our manuscript um, entitled blah, 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 found that, demonstrated that. And then in parens, you could say accepted and you can name the journal. Perfect. But that okay. would go in your narrative section. I see. Thank you very much. Sure. I have one more question. You were mm -hmm. talking about the um, research statement. So you said it would make sense to start with a personal statement and you also advise to start with a research statement. So what is the research statement? Oh, okay. So, well, what I was saying is that um, in typically for an academic position, you have lots of different things you have to write. You have to write a research statement, a teaching statement, a lot of different things. The research statement is a really long statement that talks about kind of your research plan. Um, and it's typically used for uh, jobs, new jobs, or promote when you're going up for promotion. Um, and what I like to say is that's if you have that document, it's really good to mine that document in order to develop your personal statement. So oh, I research, see. yeah, it's just a longer version of, you know, who am I as a research researcher? Sometimes within your research statement, you talk about what motivated you to get into this particular field. Um, I see. But it's, yeah, yeah. So it's just this long, it's kind of your research, and then it ends with your research agenda, what you plan to accomplish. Okay, I see. That might be cultural. I, I've never, <laughs> I haven't heard about that. So where would that go then, on your CV? Or where does that go, the research? Nowhere, statement? that's a whole separate document. That's a separate that's, thing. Yeah. That's usually, like I said, the purpose of it is um, the two things that I always think about is when you are um, being recruited, you submit a package and amongst the package is going to be your research Got statement. It. When you're going up for promotion, you have yeah. a research yeah. statement. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Uh, we do have one question in case there are others coming up. Um, what, uh, what if the proposed research is a shift of focus from past research 
any suggestions on how to frame the personal statement in this case? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, what I would do is um, I would, in your personal statement, that's the perfect place to sort of tell the story of why you're making that shift. Um, and you can tell, you can talk about what you've done in the past and, you know, try and think about how your past research has sort of led you to this point. Um, you know, so I'm a, I'm trained as a cancer and infectious disease epidemiologist, and I spent much of my career documenting disparities in a cancer outcomes and doing all these fancy models. And at some point I'm at the, I'm saying to myself, you know, enough of this documentation, let's, let's do something about this. So I've made a shift to um, developing multi, you know, hopefully developing multi-level interventions. So, but I can talk about how, you know, years of documenting disparities across outcomes, across populations has led me to wanting to do something more actionable. So I would look at it from that perspective, thinking about, you know, how is it, how is it that what you've done in the past has led you to this? Um, and then importantly, talk about the significance of what you want to do uh, to the field, you know, that, that doing this will, you know, reduce mortality or if it's something that's, you know, if you're a bench scientist that it's going to create a new treatment or something along those lines. But it's the personal statement that allows you to tell that story of your transition. And then the other piece of it is I would say, um, you can talk about how your training has positioned you to make this step. And then um, remember that I said that your, you can talk about other research products. It doesn't just have to be publications within your contributions to science. So, um, you know, maybe you've, if you're a biostatistician, maybe you've created a new algorithm. So you can talk about that in your narrative. So your contribution to science can contain some other research products that tell the reviewer who you are and why you're qualified to take on this, you know, to make this pivot. Thank you for that response. We do have one more question from um, someone um, asked in the chat. Could you please talk a little bit more about how to select the citations that go after the personal statement? Yeah, okay, sure. So there are two ways of looking at it. Um, and a lot of it depends on what your citations look, what your publications look like. And again, not just first author publications, especially for early stage investigators. Um, these can be second author, third author, you know, wherever you are in that author string. So um, first, ideally, if your publications can support the work that you propose to do in the grant, that would be great. That doesn't always happen. Um, you know, especially for early stage investigators. So the other piece of it would be um, if what you're trying to do is, um, let's say you're developing that, that example that I gave of the hepatitis B intervention. Let's say you've developed interventions, but never vaccine interventions. So your personal statement would talk about, I've had, you know, years of experience developing interventions for blah, blah, blah your publication that you'd note in that personal statement might be the publications related to the intervention development, even if it's not even related to the vaccine intervention, but it demonstrates that you've had experience in intervention development. So the second choice would be um, if you don't have enough publications to really support the grant itself, then what you might do is choose publications that support the story you're telling about yourself as an academic researcher. Thank Did you. I kind of get there? Did I get that and answer that? Um, you did. Um, unless um, someone wants to ask more questions. We do have someone raised um, a hand raised. I don't know if you want to ask the question. Go ahead. 
Uh, sure. Thank, uh, thank you very much for the uh, really informative talk. I wanted to get back to the bioarchive and uh, preprint status. You mentioned that these, those could be listed in the narrative portion of the personal statement or the uh, contribution to science. I'm wondering if it's okay to uh, give the link to those uh, preprints because they're online available for public to view? You know, that's such a good question. This is outside of my field. Um, but what I would point you to um, is my gut is saying probably, but on the slide, and I know um, Beverly's going to share these slides with you, um, there's a slide where I talk about the other research products and then I give a link. So NIH has a link to um, sort of defining these other products, and that would probably talk about how you can um, frame them in your bio sketch. All right, thank but you. I kind of think you could within the narrative. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. We do have five more minutes. Is there any other questions people have? And the person that asked about the citation said yes, responded yes, you did answer the question. <laughs> Good, thanks. I have a question about BioSketch and if you have, if you have one BioSketch, uh, like CVs, we sometimes have multiple CVs for different jobs. Um, for awards, do we tend to have more uh, different types of biosketches tailored to those different awards that we plan to apply for? Or should we have one standard yeah. that we update? Yeah, that's, that's such a great question, Beverly. You know, um, yes, the answer is that you should have variations on your biosketch. Um, typically, especially the farther along you get in your career, your contributions to science sections don't change all that much. Um, you know, they might be updated. Um, and then as you're, if, if you're expanding your work, they would be updated from that perspective. But the personal statement is really, really tailored to um, the particular grant. So. Um, you know, we, we talk to folks um, who are doing K awards and K awards are very different because in there it's a combination of research and training. And so it's a little bit different. You need to talk about your mentoring team. You need to talk about gaps in your work that the training's meant to fulfill. So without a doubt, the personal statement truly needs to be differentiated depending upon whatever award you're going after. Um, I hate to say the CV is is general and you know it's much broader and um, I think what I would recommend is that that's what you always want to keep current and um, by that literally depending on how productive you are maybe you're updating it every quarter it's just so much easier because that's what you draw from you know we all end up being you know third author on a paper that we forget about um, but then all of a sudden, it really maybe makes sense to, to go in something. So if you've kept your CV current, then you'll, you'll remember and you'll draw it in if you want to modify your personal statement to, to serve a per particular grant. But that personal statement is what for sure changes um, with, each, with each application. Um, thank you for that. Another question, we have community partners that we work with um, and sometimes they become um, lead per or key personnel and require a, a bio sketch. Sometimes it's, um, we try to generate one um, closest to the NIH because um, their work history doesn't have like the publications they don't have the research expertise how right. do we develop this I, I know that that's a different um, entire topic but just kind of any your thoughts on as we work with community yeah. in creating bio such a great question it's such a great question and while NIH has a version for pre-docs a version for postdocs a version for fellowships, and then the version that I've been explaining. 
um, they neglect to have something like this, which is really unfortunate because to your point, a community partner would have a, a very rich personal statement. Um, and obviously the section B is, is strong, but contributions to science, they're non-academic researchers. So, um, so that is challenging. Um, you know, there's nothing that says you have to have two to four sections. I guess my advice would be, and this is where the PI really needs to get involved with working with, with a community uh, partner to, to try and craft this. Um, maybe what you're doing in that section is um, you're including what we call research projects. So it could be things like um, uh, um, interventions that have been developed. You know, community partners do fabulous interventions that aren't funded necessarily, that aren't, you know, evaluated in the way that that an NIH grant would require it, but none, nonetheless, they're looked at and evaluated in, in the way that the community organization has set up. And so in that sense, my advice would be to really develop that contributions to science narrative and recognize that there won't be any public, there may not be any publications underneath that, but that's okay as long as the narrative itself tells the story of the contribution. So I think you can get creative um, because there's a wealth of information. It just has to be um, tweaked a little. Always happy to hear any feedback that you might have for me. Um, we uh, this uh, content will be shared out uh, the recording and the slide. So Beverly, did I did I get to that? You think? Oh yes. Sorry, I was talking on. I me. just heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I was trying to mute and I think I mute, um, muted myself. Yes, <laughs> we have reached the hour. I don't know if there's okay. any burning last minute question anyone has. If not, I think we, th we have come to the end. Okay. Yes, thank you so much for presenting this. And, um, You're welcome. and a lot of people have put in the chart that they uh, they they would like the slides and they and this is very helpful so thank you for um doing Terrific. this all right everyone stay well thank you Take bye bye care. bye